Well, hello and welcome to Central, where it's okay to not be okay. Wherever you're watching, we are so glad you're here. I'm Nikki, and this is Noah. Yeah, if this is your first time at Central, we want to welcome you. Uh, yes. Every one of our locations, we have a new to Central location in the lobby. Go there. We have some people that would love to meet you and get you connected with our church. And if you're watching online, you just put your name and location in the chat, and we're going to give you some shout outs Absolutely. throughout the experience. In fact, I have some special shout outs right now. Okay. We have Ethan watching from Hawaii, Richard in Arizona, and Grace watching in the Philippines. Okay. Nikki, okay. Yes. what do you think is so special about all these places? Hawaii, Arizona, and Philippines? That's right. I do not know. No daylight savings time. Ah, oh yes. Okay, daylight savings time is coming up that's this right. weekend. Gotta love that. You know, that's my favorite holiday. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, put put like a little fist bump, a little praise hands emoji if you like sleeping in. You know, that's my that's my favorite holiday. I Absolutely. Think good. I like yeah. that the phone automatically changes the time for you. Now that's a blessing. But my car does yes. not do it. I think my car is still on spring forward time. Mm. So I'm excited. I'll, so you've be... been like an hour ahead just right. for the last six months. Right, absolutely. Lord have yeah. mercy. Well, I love it. Hey, listen, we are continuing in the series, Jesus Loves. Last week, we had Dr. Jenkins. She was phenomenal. Awesome. If you haven't seen that, make sure you go on our On Demand. All of our videos are On Demand. You can check that out. Pastor Judd, if he's your favorite, like he's our favorite, we have something special coming up. Central Academy, November 14th. Pastor Judd will be teaching at the Henderson location all about the formation of the church. It's going to be incredible. That's from the Book of Acts. That's right. Also, oh, yeah. if you want to learn more about Central Academy, it's uh, offers students uh, the opportunity opportunity to discover their purpose, grow in leadership, and transform their future. Absolutely. So incredible. Hey, but listen, it's time to worship with our Central family. worship together I give you my attention all my focus pushing off the limits in this moment I feel your spirit moving all around me come and have your way I'm looking at the dry bones you're reviving this faith inside of my soul you're igniting you're calling me Everything else fades 
How are we feeling out there, Central Church? Come on, let's continue to lift our voices together. When night has fallen, when fear is calm, still you're cold in me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. And when my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up, cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Hey, Central Online family. My name's Noah. I'm part of the online team here at Central. Uh, if you're watching from your living room or a coffee shop or in a watch party, uh, we're glad that you're here. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, we have a link that's pinned in the chat on all of our platforms. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Fill out that form, check the box that says, I'm new here. and. The online team or I would just love to reach out to you and get to know you a little bit better. But hey, listen, we got people watching from all over the world and I just wanna give a few shout outs to some people on our YouTube channel. We have Caden watching from Honduras. We have Celine watching from California. We have Paul watching from the Philippines and we have Carrie joining us from Florida. Thanks for joining us. We'd love for you to subscribe and share the experience. If you, for whatever reason, missed last week's experience, it's on demand. You can go to our website at centralchurch.online. Watch that. Dr. Tara Jenkins did a phenomenal job with the message and we'd love for you to just experience that. Um, also, hey, listen, we have a, a new online store here at Central. You can go to centralchurch.store and get all kinds of awesome Central merch, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, anything you would like. And lastly, we are a 24-hour church. If you want to get connected with our care team, you can reach out to them at central.family. Hey, listen, at Central, we love to share life stories about how God's grace changes lives. Check out this story from Shaniqua. At the age of 13 is when um, our whole family basically hit rock bottom of us being kicked out of our home. Um, and we had to sleep in a car with um, my other siblings and my mom. I realized at a young age that I didn't want that for my life. Um, it was a little too late because that moment I dropped out of high school because we didn't have a place or anything to go to. Or um, I, I think I was ashamed. I tried to do everything I could in my own power to help my mom, although I couldn't do much. 
And so that was being the emotional support for her. It was, it was really hard uh, just seeing her struggle and wanting to do more, but just no matter what she did, it felt like she just couldn't catch up with um, what she wanted to provide. At the age of 19 and 20, I decided to um, reach out for help, but that wasn't with people. Um, it was actually with God. <laughs> My neighbor and I, we were bored one day, and she invited me to go to church with her and her family. And so me stepping into Central, it was overwhelming at first. I didn't know how to worship God. I didn't know what um, the pastor was even talking about, but there's a sense of me belonging as soon as I stepped in. And so I became a part of it and took the right steps to be a part of the Central family um, almost 10 years ago. So I got baptized the summer of 2012 um, and then jumped right into First Step and learning just about how to read the Bible and um, being a part of community and also serving the church and serving God. That's how I really became involved with uh, serving our youth and central youth ministry or um, even with Hope for the City in our, um, when the pandemic happened, um, serving at the food pantries. It's because I was able to see families and kids who are in similar situations that um, I grew up in. I no longer can just sit in my own mess or my own um, shame or sadness that is connected to my past, but to um, help families and kids um, take steps in their journey as well, uh, to help them see a way out of their current situation. One of the most amazing things we get to do here at Central is our initiative called Hope for Kids. Hope for Kids is where we get to provide um, basic necessities for families who uh, wouldn't be able to receive those things if it was on their own. Um, so kids will be able to see a beautiful light experience while they drive through and receive basic necessities like um, a meal and toys for Christmas and um, just those things that their family or parents parents wouldn't be able to provide. One in six kids will go hungry this holiday season, and in the city that we live in, that is unacceptable. Would you consider jumping in and being a part of Hope for Kids this year by sponsoring a kid in need? With your help, we're going to give thousands of kids a Christmas they'll never forget. What an incredible story. So thankful for what God's done in Shaniqua's life. And you never know what an act of generosity will do in someone's life. That's why we want to encourage you during this season where we have this initiative called Hope for Kids to really pray and ask God what he would have you to give to bless these kids. So many kids in our city, as Shaniqua just said, are in need. Tens of thousands of, of kids, in fact, in our city need our help. And we can, we can step in and we can make a difference in their life. You know, we've been challenging the Central family to sponsor 30,000 kids this Christmas. And uh, it's really exciting to see how the Central family has already gotten behind this initiative. And just right before I came up on the stage, they told me that we're now over 10,000 kids sponsored towards that goal. Come on, church. That's awesome. So good. And I want to encourage you, let's keep going because as exciting as it is that we've got 10,000 kids sponsored, I think about the 20,000 kids yet to be sponsored. And that's where you and I can come in. Just asking God, God, what would you have us to do? For some, that might be sponsoring one at $50, might be five, might be 10, might be 50 or more. It's all of us just asking God, what can we do? And I believe if we all pull together, I believe if we all ask that prayer, God, what would you have me to do? We'll get to the end of this, this season and we'll celebrate 30,000 kids that have been blessed to the generosity of the Central Family. Don't you believe that, church? I believe that. So I want to encourage you to make that gift. Make your first gift go to a child in need this Christmas. It's easy to do. You can go to central.family. You can find one of our generosity team members in the lobby wearing a red apron. You can give by credit or debit card, or you can find uh, our ushers with the buckets. You can give by check or cash. But thank you. Thank you for loving people. Thank you for being a difference maker. And thank you for your generosity that's helping so many people in our city. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Would you join me? 
Well, Jesus, we just pause and we say thank you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. God, let us absorb your love. Father, you tell us that for those of us that don't love, we don't know love. So help us to know your love. Help us to experience your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness in our life so we can offer mercy and forgiveness and grace to others. God, let us absorb your generosity tonight. The way that you've been generous to us so we can reflect that same generosity to a world that desperately needs to know that you care for them and you love them equally. So God, I pray that you would guide us to bless others. Thank you for the 10,000 kids that are assured of a blessing. And God, I pray for those remaining kids to be sponsored. God, may you do what only you can do. We need your guidance and we need your help to show us what you'd have us to do. And so, Father, as you speak to us and you tell us, we will respond with a resounding yes, with faith and courage, knowing that you'll never fail us if that's what you ask of us. And God, as we worship you, Jesus, as we lift your name on high, I pray that you would just wrap your loving arms about us as we worship you at your throne. For we ask this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Come on and declare that Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory See a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. their depression, their anxiety, their fear, their worry, and he's going to turn it into good. Come on, let's declare this together. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Come on, somebody. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, and declare it today. You take what the enemy did. 
Anybody believe that in this room today? Come on. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from the book of Isaiah. It says, do you not know, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God? He's the creator of all the universe. He never grows weak or weary. No one can fathom the depths of his understanding because he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths and young men will fall in exhaustion. But listen, those who hope and trust in the Lord will find a new strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint, yet they will soar high on wings like eagles. The victory is already in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. take a moment and pray for you if you're here today and you need God's help whatever you're faced with if we can just say a simple prayer of your life today would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air and if you're next to somebody with their hand raised I want to encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them let's just pray let's ask God to do what only he can do God right now we bring our burdens our pain our difficulties our challenges our hurts we just lay them all down at the foot of the cross. And Lord, today we accept the fact that the victory is ours because you've already defeated death through your son, Jesus. So God, I pray that you would give us wings to soar above the issues, above the turmoil, above the pain. God, we put our hope and our trust in you. Thank you for your goodness, for it's in your name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. Bring your burdens, bring your pain, and bring your worries, your hurting, bring your shame. We don't need them anymore, because we are standing in the presence of the Lord. Every voice, God is in this house. Come on. And that's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. Oh, be forgiven, be restored. 
find your healing all you need is so much more God is in this house God is in this house and that's all that matters now that's all that matters now come on God is in this house oh God is in this house and that's all That's all that matters, all that matters now. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, if you feel comfortable, lift your hands and declare this today. Let fear give way to freedom. Sing it. Let fear give way to freedom. Let hurt give way to healing. Standing here on holy ground. Anything can happen now. And in the name of Jesus, all death Amen. Amen. What a powerful, powerful time of worship. We want to welcome all of our locations, especially that Sunrise Mountain location. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for worshiping with us. We also want to give a shout out to those of you who have watch parties who are watching online. Welcome and thank you for worshiping with us today. Absolutely. And to the men and women watching in prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars yeah. and the Panda app, we're glad you're here. Yes, absolutely. No matter where you're experiencing church from right now, we want you to help us give it up for our senior pastor, Pastor Judd Wilhite. All right, all right. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for being here with us. How many of you remember the hashtag from several years ago, the struggle is real? Anybody remember this? Somebody may have used that again recently. It's kind of, it never, that's never going to go out of style, right? Because the struggle is real. In fact, uh, if you're a parent right now, you've got young kids, the struggle is real. I saw this on social media. I thought it was pretty funny. It says, silence is golden, but when you have kids, silence is suspicious. Man, when you're a parent of young kids, all you want is for a moment of peace, which by the way, church is great for that. I'm just throwing that out there. All you want is for a moment of peace, but I think the reality is when you get that moment of peace, if they're not asleep, you immediately know something is up, man, and it gets sketchy pretty fast. The struggle is real. Uh, for a lot of people, the money struggle is real. I saw this, thought it was pretty funny. Uh, guy says, my card was declined for ramen noodles. 
I was buying one bag. The cashier said, man, just take it. I mean, it's bad when even the cashier's like, dude, you need help, bro. One bag of ramen noodles. Somebody relates to that. All right, one more. This kid says, just cleaned out my backpack. These are real words I turned in for a grade. <laughs> this kid should be like an attorney or a doctor. The struggle is real. Some of you are in school right now, and you're just trying to survive and get through it, and the struggle feels real. And all of us are in some kind of struggle in our life. A health struggle. Sometimes you're in a struggle and you don't even know what's going on. You're just tired. You're in a funk. You're not sure what's happening. Somebody today is in a spiritual struggle. They're struggling with God. They're struggling with what they feel like God's leading them to do. Somebody's in a struggle with a sin area in their life or a weakness that they just keep giving into. And that struggle just continues to haunt you. Somebody's struggling in relationships. Somebody's struggling. Look, if you're a Raiders fan, you need counseling. If you're a Phillies fan, man, the last few games in the World Series, the struggle is real. And now it's getting really real. So it's just, we all face struggle. And I have a simple message for you today that I think is going to be so encouraging. And that is this. God not only shows up in the struggle, but he can show off in the struggle. God not only can show up in your struggle, but he can show off in your struggle. We've been in this teaching series, we just called it Jesus Loves, and uh, we've been looking through the Gospels at Jesus' different encounters with people and seeing how his love can make a difference. We've talked about how Jesus loves me in my mess, Jesus loves me in my pain, um, and today I want to talk to you about how Jesus loves me in my struggle. Jesus loves me in my struggle, because we all struggle. In fact, one person that we uh, see in the Gospels in John chapter 9 is an individual who had struggled up to this point most of his life. In John 9, Jesus is walking along. He's near the temple in Jerusalem, um, the capital city, and there would have been a lot of different people around. There would have been like politicians, and there would have been religious um, leaders, but also the poor and the lame and those who were sick and who were struggling. They would have all been there around the temple. And the poor and the lame were there because that was a place where they could get charity, where they could ask people for help in a society where there was no social system really to to catch people who are struggling. And so John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, Jesus walks along and he comes upon this individual. When we get to the red word, just say it real loud with me. It's how we're going to make sure everybody is awake. All right, here we go. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he what? Saw. He what? Saw. saw. He saw, but check out who he saw. He saw a man who had been blind from birth. So Jesus saw somebody who had never seen anything in his life. Jesus saw somebody who had been blind from birth. He saw somebody who couldn't see. And I think that just jumped out at me as I went back to this passage this week because I think so often when we're hurting and when we're struggling, we feel alone. We feel invisible. We feel like nobody can see us. We feel like people look right past us. And it's easy in those moments to start thinking, I mean, does God care? Does my group of uh, friends who are followers of Jesus, do they care? Does the, does the church care? Does anybody care? Does everybody just sort of look around me? And we just want to pull back. And so I want to speak to somebody today because you're not sure where God is right now and you're not sure where hope is right now and you're not sure what's going on in your life. And I want you to hear this today. Jesus sees you. He sees you. The Bible says even the hair on our head is numbered. Come on, and for some of us, it's less hair today than it was yesterday. You know what I'm saying. But the Bible says, look, even a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground outside of the knowledge of the Father. So God knows. He knows what you're facing. He knows your struggle. He knows the tension. He knows what's going on at home. He knows how some of you are dreading the holidays. He knows how some of you are dreading work. He knows how some of you are in the struggle with kids right now. And I want you to understand that Jesus didn't just see a blind man on the street that the Bible tells us Jesus can see us today in our pain and in our suffering and that he cares. He sees you. He sees you. And so I want to give you three simple things to avoid if you're in the struggle today. Three things to avoid. Three don'ts, if you will. Three things to, to not do 
in the struggle. And the first is this, don't give up on God. If you're in the struggle right now, don't give up on God. Jim Gaffigan, funny, funny guy. Uh, I saw this slide uh, from one of his things. He says, if being overwhelmed made you lose weight, I'd be so thin right now. Um, wouldn't that be the coolest diet plan ever? Like just being overwhelmed. How many, how many of you know what it feels like recently to just be overwhelmed? Especially now we're going into the holidays. There's like all the things are cranking up. And look, man, if I get one more text on my phone about some political person who wants... <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind. Anybody feeling that? I'm just like, and, and with, you know, if, like I always say, like, you know, report, report junk. You know, you put there, and I'm like, there's nobody listening in the universe. I've done this 500 times, but I'm going to get a text probably tonight, probably today, you know, just boom, here we go. But I mean, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And this guy who was born blind, he had surely done his time feeling overwhelmed. He had not only the tension going on in his life of being blind, of not being able to earn a living, of not being able to work, of being dependent on others, being in a place where he had to beg and depend on the charity of others. But then to add to that, he had the stigma that came with having a situation like this. Because a lot of people at the time felt like that if you were blind, if you had some kind of significant uh, disability in your life, that that was divine judgment over your life. That somebody sinned. Your family sinned. Your great-grandparents sinned. Somebody, you sinned. Somebody sinned for you to be in that situation. And, and that's where he is. In fact, you see it come out. As Jesus is walking along, he sees this man. And then his disciples, his crew, his guys, they immediately ask him about this. Look at this. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. It says, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? And look at their assumption. Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? I mean, their assumption doesn't leave a lot of other room, right? Somebody sinned or this guy wouldn't be blind. So was it his parents or, or, or was it him? And look at Jesus' answer. He says, it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the what? The power of God could be seen in him. Now listen, this is a verse that we all need to kind of sit with for a minute because it should challenge us to be very cautious about the assumptions we make about somebody else's suffering. This is a verse that should cause us all to step back a little bit and realize life is way more complicated and mysterious than we often want to reduce it back to being. You want to look and you want to say, oh man, they're going through that. I wonder what they did. Right? I wonder what they did in their life to be going through that. Man, they're struggling. I wonder what, look, if they just had faith, they'd be healed. If they just had faith, they wouldn't go through all the stuff they go through. If they just had stuff together spiritually, everything else would flow out in their life. And friends, look, I understand how we can get to that place and that way of thinking. That's what Job's friends thought as well in the Old Testament. Job's friends circled up and Job's friends are like, hey man, you know, what'd you do? And Job's like, I didn't do anything. And they're like, come on, bro. We weren't born yesterday. Spill the tea, man. What'd you do? And they're like, no, no. And they're like, come on. And this goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter until God shows up in Job. And who does God rebuke? He rebuke. well, he, he, he handles Job. But he rebukes the friends. Because he's like, you guys, you don't know what you're talking about. Right? So just a word for me and for all of us. Let's not assume the worst when somebody's struggling about their life and about the choices they've made. Let's not immediately put them in a box. Let's assume that we don't know why they're struggling or why they're going through this. But Jesus says, here's the deal. It wasn't this person's sins or their parents' sins, but that the power of God might be displayed. In other words, God can show up in the struggle, but he can also show off in the struggle. And it's in the struggle when God does some of his greatest work in our lives. I remember once after weekend services, I was, um, this woman walked up to me. She, she was a younger uh, woman and she, she said, look, I, I've got a friend at work. She's losing her sight. And um, 
the other coworkers that I work with are saying that this is like somehow her fault, like she sinned or her parents sinned or she doesn't have enough faith or she would be healed, like this is God's judgment over her life and over her lack of faith. And she said, what do, what do I say to her? And I immediately was just able to go to John chapter 9, and I said, well, you know, Jesus kind of dealt with a very similar situation and told the story that we just started to look at, and I said, it wasn't, there, it wasn't his sins or his parents' sins, but it was that the power of God might be displayed. And, and then it was one of those moments, many of you have had them, where you just sense like, I think I call it a Holy Spirit moment, I just realized like, wait a minute, this isn't about her friend, this is about her. And I just looked up at her and I said, you're losing your sight, aren't you? And she said, yeah, the doctors tell me there's nothing else they can do. Like progressively over the next several years, I'm going to eventually lose all of my sight. And I was able to just speak life into her from John 9 to just say, look, I want you to hear this. I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I have no idea why you're going through this. But this is what I do know based on the word of God. I know that this isn't about your sin or your parents' sin. I know that this isn't about playing the blame game. I know that God loves you, not because of your circumstance, but because of what he did for us on the cross through Jesus Christ. I know that God loves you, not because of the struggle you're in, but because of all that he's already done for you historically. And while I may not have all the answers, my challenge is to lean into God in this moment and trust him in this moment and let him do a miracle in your life in this moment. And he may give you your sight back, but he may give you sight that isn't even connected to your physical sight. That's a spiritual sight and a sense of uh, discernment in your life. He may do a miracle you're not even expecting. And I'll never forget that moment because her whole countenance changed. That's the power of God's word over our lives. If you're struggling today, I'm so sorry for what you're facing, and I don't know why you're facing it, but I want you to hear this. The word of God is clear. Jesus loves you even in the midst of the struggle. The struggle doesn't mean you're not seen. The struggle doesn't mean that you're not loved. Look, the struggle doesn't mean that God's thrown you on the scrap heap. It's not about punishment, but it may be about seeing God's power released in your struggle. God's power often shows up when you feel powerless. Come on, somebody. God's power often shows up in the weakness. God's power often shows up when we're not sure how we're going to get through a situation, and then God reminds us, oh, it wasn't about you knowing how you were going to get through that situation. It was about me showing you I'm going to get you through that situation, and I'll get you through every situation. So don't give up on God. Don't look, the temptation is to pull back. The temptation is to not come to church. The temptation is to not engage in group. The temptation is to not open your Bible app and do your devotional time. The temptation is to stop praying. The temptation is to just walk around and be discouraged. And I get it, but we got to push back on that in the struggle and say, I'm not giving up on God. I'm not giving up on his word. I'm not giving up on church. I'm not giving up on my friends. I'm not going to believe the worst about others. I'm going to believe people love me. I'm going to believe even though we don't understand, God's going to see me through. I'm going to believe God isn't finished and he isn't done with me yet. I'm not dead yet. So I'm not done yet. So God's going to do something in the middle of this mess. Don't give up on God. That's my first don't. Here's my second. Don't look past your miracle. Don't look past your miracle. Um, I, uh, in John, chapter 9, you know, you have this moment where uh, uh, Jesus comes up, and, and here's this guy. He's been in the midst of a difficult situation. He's sitting there. He sees him. He goes up to him, and look at, look at what we see. John chapter 9, very next sentence says, then Jesus, he, sp he spit in the ground and made what? Mud with saliva. And everybody go, ooh. Ooh, he spit in the ground made mud. Now that was, look, mud in the ancient world was like duct tape. And I don't know about you, but man, I, when I was growing up as a kid, I felt like all I needed was duct tape. I could fix anything with the, I wear my socks, they get a hole in them, duct tape. You know, something breaks, I just be like, mom, where's the duct tape? You know, she, cause if I felt, now I grew up in Texas, y'all, it wasn't very sophisticated. Okay. 
But if I could get the duct tape, man, that was all I needed. I could, I could fix it. Well, mud and saliva was actually like the duct tape of the ancient world. I mean, this was a common, even rabbinical way of healing people. They would use this. So these were common, everyday elements. Jesus spits into the dirt. He makes some mud, and he puts it on the blind man's eyes. And then he tells him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. And so the man went and washed and came back seeing. Now, the last part of that sentence is amazing. He came back seeing. But, but did you notice when you look up here, like, there's no, Jesus, it may have been implied that if you go and you wash in the pool of Siloam, that you're going to be able to see. But he doesn't say that. He just puts mud on his eyes. He's like, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I mean, I don't know. You think the guy's walking along like, maybe I'll get 10% vision? You know, maybe I'll get a little vision. Maybe it'll be complete healing. But in the moment, Jesus uses everyday elements to get him started on the journey towards his miracle. And God can use everyday elements in our lives as well. In fact, when you think about just different kinds of miracles, I think it's, it's helpful to maybe loosely sort of categorize them just to kind of have a framework for what we're talking about. When, it looks, when you look at miracles in the Bible, like, like we often think of spectacular miracles, right? I'm talking about like God parting the waters of the Red Sea or Lazarus being raised from the dead or these amazing, spectacular miracles. And if you're praying for a miracle in, in your life, my hunch is you're praying for a spectacular miracle, that God would provide for you financially, that you could hit the power ball, that God would do something huge uh, physically, take the cancer away, make the tumor go away, that he would do a spectacular miracle in your life. And, and let me just say, I, I do believe God can heal. I do believe God works miracles today. I've seen him do it in people's lives. Many of you have seen it or experienced it, things you can't explain. I believe God can and will and does do spectacular miracles in people's lives, okay? You were getting there. You are coming around. But sometimes we think if it's not a spectacular miracle, it's not a miracle at all. And I want to suggest there's another kind of category of miracles that we might just call everyday miracles. God can use mud and spit. God can use everyday thing. God can use other people. Maybe, you, maybe you're praying that God will do a, a, a work of life change in your life, that God will take away certain cravings or desires in your life, that God would change your heart, and you're praying that he'll do it spectacularly. You know, we hear of people that are just like, wake up, and they're like, well, you know, I never drank again, or whatever. It was a spectacular, right? It was amazing. And maybe God will do that in your life. But we also hear a lot of people, it didn't happen that way in their life, even though they prayed the same prayers and they had tremendous faith. But what happened? happened is everyday people got around them. They got plugged into a community like Celebrate Recovery. They found accountability in the context of other people, and the everyday stuff became a miracle, right? God, look, if you go to the doctor and he tells you you have cancer, I'm praying. If you come to me and ask me to pray, I am praying that God heals you, just so we're, we're clear. You know, he's God, right? I'm like praying like, throw it down, God. Show off. Do something amazing, spectacular, but I'm also going to tell you, go to the doctor. Because it might be that at the doctor, God has provided through everyday means, insight, medicine, knowledge that can help you in your life. And you may get your miracle, but it may not be the spectacular in a flash miracle. It may be the on the other side of chemo miracle. But you still get your miracle. And then another kind of miracle, maybe we just call it loosely the unexpected miracle. And all miracles in some ways might be unexpected, but what I mean is sometimes you don't get the miracle you're praying for. God, take the, take the tumor away. And sometimes the doctors go in and, and they say, we can't get it all, right? And even the everyday things that you turn to, there's no miracle there. But then what you find is through the journey, even though you don't get the miracle you're praying for, God does an unexpected miracle in your heart. I can't tell you how many times people have gone through hard things like cancer and have told me, Pastor, on the other side, look, I, I, um, 
I never thought I would say this, but I don't think I could go back to not having cancer. It has done so much for me on the other side. In other words, their perspective was changed. Their heart was changed. There were unexpected miracles that happened along the way. And sometimes, I want you to think about this, the miracle God does in you is greater than the miracle he may do for you. It's unexpected. And so you're praying that God will do something spectacular and, and, and maybe he does it every day or you're praying that God will use any means every day, whatever kind of means to help you and it doesn't feel like he does. Maybe he doesn't answer the prayer that you prayed again and again and again, but he gives you an unexpected miracle in a different way. And I just think it's, it's important to frame all of that up. But God can work through a lot of different sources. There's an old story about... Uh, uh, a pastor who was in a, a really dangerous flood. And um, as the water was rising, the rescue teams were going out and this guy comes by in like a, a canoe, like a kayak, you know, and he's kayaking and he says, pastor, get in the canoe. You know, come on, let's get out of here. Let's get you out of here. And he says, no, no, God's going to save me. I put all my faith and all my trust in God. It's like, okay, so they go on. And so a little bit later, the water's risen a little more now. And, and now, uh, you know, the pastor's on the second story on, on the balcony, and a boat comes by. And the guy in the rescue boat says, Pastor, get in the boat. You know, let's go get in the boat. He says, no, 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 God's going to save me. I put all my faith and all my trust in God. And then a little later, he's on the roof now, and a helicopter comes by. And they drop a rope, and they're like, Pastor, grab onto the rope, man. It's your last chance. Come on, get out of here. He says, no, no, I'm praying that God will do a miracle in my life and God will save me. Next time we see the pastor, well, he's in heaven. And he's angry. He walks up to God and he says, God, I trusted you. I put all my faith in you. I did everything. I mean, I even stood on that roof and you let me die. And God says, what are you talking about? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What more do you want? Sometimes the miracle is right in front of you. And when you're struggling, you can miss it. When you're struggling, you can miss it. Sometimes you're praying for one miracle, and the real miracle that you need is actually happening right in front of you. And you can be missing it. So this guy goes to the pool, or to Salome, and, and uh, it says the, the Salome means sent. And this is what I, we have several miracles like this in the Bible. Uh, I, I call them along the way miracles. Like as somebody's doing what they're commanded to do, along the way he gets there, he washes, and then suddenly the miracle happens. Or you might think of them as slow motion miracles. It didn't just happen, but Jesus said, go do these things. And if he obeyed and followed through, then the miracle came through. And I think we experience these a lot in our lives. Maybe you look at a guy or a girl in your life and you think right now, like, we need a miracle. Come on, somebody. We need a miracle. But you say, look, I'm going to pray for a miracle, but I'm going to keep being kind. I'm going to keep being loving. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep setting healthy boundaries. And then what you may find is the miracle can happen along the way as you're obeying God and following him. You say, I need a miracle in my finances. Well, you know, you can, you can pray that prayer, but you can also keep working hard and keep honoring God with your money and keep on trying to dial back your expenses and dial up your contentment. And the miracle can happen along the way. Right, God can heal your heart along the way. He can empower you with his spirit along the way. He can bring peace into your home along the way. He can restore your relationships with your kids along the way. He can develop your gifts. He can fill you with joy along the way. He can heal you and give you self-control and make you stronger and give you wisdom. He can bless you financially. He can bring forgiveness into your life and he can do it along the way. So if you're struggling right now, don't give up on God. And if you're in the struggle right now, don't look past your miracle. God may be doing miracles all around you. In fact, when you think about it, every day that we get to wake up and breathe, it's a miracle. Every day that we get to walk out the door and face a crazy world, it's a miracle. Don't look past the miracles he, he's already doing. And then my third don't is simply this. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't keep it all to yourself. So this guy gets healed. It's an amazing miracle. He can see again. And he starts going around and telling people, Jesus healed me. 
Jesus healed me. He did this amazing miracle in my life. Like, Jesus did this. And you know what you find? Some people celebrated. They were excited that, Jesus, that this guy got this miracle. But other people were mad that he got the miracle. Look, not everybody's going to celebrate if you get your miracle. Come on, not everybody's going to be happy for you if you get your miracle. I mean, right there in front. Some people believed. Some people didn't believe. And so here's this guy. And he's like telling people what Jesus has done. And the religious leaders get wind of this. And they're not really team Jesus at this point, right? Hello. And so they bring him in and they basically start harassing him. And then they bring his parents in. Like, was he really born blind? Really? Come on. You know, like they're, they're putting the pressure on. Now think about it. My assumption is if he's born blind in the ancient world, if he's sitting at the temple and more than likely begging, depending on others for charity, that he's probably a poor, uneducated individual. And here's these wealthy, wise, educated, religious people. And they are, they're putting it on thick. And what does he say to that? He can't quote books. He can't start, you know, well, let me give you the five proofs. For how I can see. One, two, three, four, five. Right there. What's he going to do? I love what he does. John chapter 9, beginning of verse 25. This is his response. He says, I know this. <laughs> I was blind. And now I can what? Now I can see. I mean, like... All these educated, wealthy, religious people are ganging up on him. He's got his parents in there. Everybody's got, and he's like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know about, I don't know all the stuff about Jesus, but here's what I can tell you. I was blind, and now I can see, right? I, I, all I can tell you is a miracle happened in my life. And let me just suggest to you that, that it can be a powerful thing to study and no arguments for why you believe. And you should know the reason for the hope that you have. And there's a lot of great books and material out there to help you do that. It can be a powerful thing. But in the end, there's nothing more powerful than the simple act of your story and what God did in your life to represent that to somebody else. Because it's really hard to argue with your story, right? You can argue with a lot of things, but it's hard to argue when somebody goes, I don't know, man, I was blind, and, and now, now I can see. This is what God has done in my life. Look, no one wants to struggle, but I want you to think about this. One day, your struggle will become your story. One day, your, your, your trouble will be your testimony. One day, the difficult thing you're facing now will be the thing that God uses when you share it with somebody else. Don't keep it to yourself when God works in your life and in mine. You know, I read again this week that the overwhelming majority of followers of Jesus, in America especially, have never shared their faith once. The overwhelming majority have never shared their faith once. And I think sometimes it's because we, we think, man, I got to know all these scriptures and I have to have everything figured out. I got to know, you know, all the right things to say. I don't want to mess it up. And then, you know, I'm not the, most, the best person. You know, I'm just every day. And I just want to remind everybody, it's not about having the right, uh, you know, the, the best scriptures all lined up. It's not about having all the answers. I don't have all the answers. We'll never have all the answers. All you have to do is share what God has done in your life. All you have to do is your version of what the blind man did. I was blind, <laughs> but now I see. God showed up and he worked in my life. I can't explain it, but he did something that, that you know, I, I'll, never, I'll never get over and, and it changed me. In fact, uh, this week I, I went on, <laughs> excuse me, uh, I have been fighting the flu the last couple weeks, in case you can hear that, but it is not COVID. I've tested and tested and tested and tested and tested and tested. And just feel like I need to say this true confession moment. My daughter's like, wow, what does that mean? I said, I, you know, I don't know. She goes, I think you're just real world sick. I'm like, I forgot what that was. I'm like, <laughs> All that to say, I put on social media this question. I said, answer this sentence for me. I believe Jesus was real when? And these were some of the answers that people shared. They were moving. People said, I believe Jesus was real 
when he saved my marriage. I believe Jesus was real when he got my mom off drugs and he restored our relationship. I believe Jesus was real when he gave me strength and guidance to pull myself out of the pit of despair. I believe Jesus was real when he removed my obsession for alcohol or when he made it impossible to lose custody of my son or when I was in the hospital with cancer and I felt this immense sense of love and calm and peace. I believe Jesus was real when he answered my prayer or when he blessed us with a child after years of infertility, when he got me out of my mess, when I finally had a group of real friends when he rescued me from heartbreak and showed me love when I felt unworthy of it. Listen, if you're in the struggle right now, I want you to know that you're in a room filled with people, many of whom have come through what you're going through. People who can say, I was once blind, blind to God's love, blind to my own value, blind to the things God wanted to do in my life, but now I see. I was once lost in my own mess, but now I am found. I was once lonely, but now I have found some community. I was once addicted, but now I have found freedom. I was once drowning, but now I can literally move forward in the love of God. I was once anxious, but now I have peace. I was once in the darkness of despair, but now I have light and hope. I was once angry, but now I have more joy and compassion. I was once unworthy, but now I know that I am loved and valued. I once was far from God, but now I am called a friend of God. And when you're in the struggle, don't keep it to yourself. What God has done in your life, don't keep it to yourself. In fact, the greatest miracle God may want to do in your life right now is use you to be a miracle for somebody else. Maybe you're praying for your miracle story and God wants you to be somebody else's miracle story. And if you'll share your story, who knows what he could do with it. Just share what God did. You don't have to get weird about it. Just at the right time, share how God moved and worked in your life. Offer to bring somebody along with you to church or take them to coffee or bring them to your group or bring them along with you to celebrate recovery or bring them with you to an area where you can serve. We've, our food pantries are going in our communities all over the place. You want to serve? You want to give back? Just come help. Jump in. Serve. Just simple little things along the way. and God can do amazing things when we lean into him. So don't give up on God. Don't overlook your miracle. Don't stop sharing your story. God not only can show up in the struggle, but he can show off in the struggle. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith and I'd love to give you that opportunity just to reach out to Jesus. I want you to know he sees you and he loves you and he came and lived and died and rose again for you. And he can bring forgiveness and hope and restoration and peace to your life as you open your heart to him. So I want to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus today, you can begin that journey by just repeating a simple prayer after me. You can say this out loud or in your own heart and mind. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just to acknowledge you're going to trust him and you're going to follow him today. Just slip your hand in the air. Reach out to him. Wherever you're watching, even if you're home, if you're alone, slip your hand in the air. God, thank you for your love. We thank you for the kindness you show us every day. And I pray for those reaching out to you right now, God. I pray you'll do a miracle in their life. I pray you'll do a miracle of forgiveness and restoration and healing. God, will you work and move Remind them that you see them today, that you love them, and that you've got this. God, we bring our struggle to you, and we entrust it to you. In Christ's name, amen. Let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. 
If you made a spiritual commitment, I just wanna tell you congratulations. And we wanna encourage you, after the experience across our locations, go out to the Next Step area. We'd love to give you a free journal. It's called How to Follow uh, Jesus. It'll be a great tool for you over the next coming days and weeks as you follow God. Or you can also go online to central.family and just click the link, I've decided to follow Jesus, and we will send that to you electronically as well. Well, let's put our hands together now for each of our locations as they come out to close out our experience. Well, what an incredible message. Wasn't that awesome about Jesus's love when we're struggling? That is a word right there. I loved it. And listen, family, if you made that prayer, first of all, I want to congratulate you, congratulate you for making the best decision you could have ever made. And right now, what I want you to do is go to central.family, click on that button that says, I decided to follow Jesus. And we're gonna send you some resources to help you along in your journey. That's right. And I would love to connect with you throughout the week. We have a link in the chat. You can go there, fill out the form. Let us know if you're new. You can also text me at 702-919-4277. And throughout the week, I can just respond, get to know you, pray for you, and just uh, just you know help you along in your faith journey. Also, hey, listen, if you enjoyed this weekend experience, we would love for you to share it uh, with your friends and family. But the weekend isn't just for the weekend. You can check us out on Spotify. You can go to our podcast. Uh, Just, you know, take the weekend with you throughout the week. Absolutely. And listen, family, before you go, we want you to hang on to Romans 8. That says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.